For today's case, we're in Yorkton, southeastern Saskatchewan, Canada. One of the people that called Yorkton home was Michaela Barley. Michaela was 16 years old and had dreams of becoming either a kindergarten teacher or a vet. Michaela loved to read, especially The Hunger Games, and play fantasy video games. She was more quiet and shy, but her mother Paula said she made being a parent easy. Paula called her a warm and precious kid who was always looking to please. She loved to take photos of nature in the outdoors and adored spending time with her little brother and sister, with whom she shared a close bond. The 12th of April, 2016, 10.12am. Michaela's friend Shelby received a text message. Michaela and Shelby had met on the third day of the ninth grade, with Shelby saying, Michaela came up to me and she poked me on the shoulder and was like, hey, come sit with us. So we became like a big group of ten of us. As they moved up through school and got to the 11th grade, Shelby and Michaela were just as close. They would chat like most typical teenagers about everything from teachers to family. That day, Shelby didn't have her phone with her and didn't see the message until she got home from school. It said, hey, I need help. It was followed by another message 20 minutes later saying, never mind, I figured it out. The messages had come from Michaela. Strangely, Shelby also received a call from the school, asking if she had seen Michaela as she had failed to turn up when her grandmother arrived to collect her. She hadn't seen her. When Michaela's grandmother had turned up at the school, Michaela was not stood outside waiting for her. She headed inside to see if she was still in the building, but concerningly, her teachers and classmates said they hadn't seen her for most of the day. Michaela had music lessons after school. She had a recital coming up and she'd been practicing the night before, Paula said. Maybe Michaela had gone to her music class early, but after checking, it was soon discovered that she wasn't there. Michaela's grandmother then went straight to Paula's work to tell her her daughter was missing. The day had started off as it normally did, with Michaela and Paula getting ready together. Paula said there was nothing out of the ordinary. They then got into the car and Michaela's grandmother dropped Paula at work and Michaela at school. Michaela attended Sacred Heart High School, which backed onto woods that surrounded Hopkins Lake. She was a conscientious and responsible student. Why, therefore, had she not gone to her classes? When Paula heard that she had skipped school, she knew that something wasn't right. You raise a kid from the time they're born. You know them so well, and for this to be the situation, I just knew instantly that something, something was amiss. She tried to text Michaela, but there was nothing. That evening, Michaela Barley was reported missing to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, also known as the RCMP. When I came home to grab some pictures to take to the RCMP station, to look in that box where I always keep cash for emergency situations, it wasn't locked and Michaela knew where it was. To see all that money sitting there, just to be sitting there not taken, I'll admit it, I had a freak out right there, she said. Also in the house was her daughter's phone charger. Nothing seemed out of place. One of the first things the RCMP did was talk to Michaela's friends to try and build up a picture of her last known movements, and they looked at the day before she had gone missing, the 11th of April 2016. Michaela had gone to have lunch with her friends, where she talked about going away, potentially to Moose Jaw and Prince Albert. Shelby and other friends remembered Michaela saying she was due to be going on holiday to Regina with the family. Shelby later told investigators that she remembered Michaela talking about a boy named Josh the day before she went missing, but when she tried to get more information, Michaela didn't respond. After having lunch, they headed back to school for class, and her teacher described Michaela as appearing to be upset. At 4.35, she texted a friend to ask for a ride to the bank, saying it was very important. Less than an hour later, at 5.30, Michaela called the TD Bank customer services three times in 30 minutes. She also checked her balance and made a transfer of $25. That evening, between 8.50 and 9.30, she sent texts to a couple of friends and an ex-boyfriend. She told one of her friends that she needed help. When the friend asked what the problem was, Michaela didn't respond. Her other friend received a message about a boy, feeling bad for someone and crying. Her ex later said that she said she wasn't happy and was thinking of leaving town for a couple of days. One of her friends named Amy said that Michaela had told her someone called Christopher was travelling to Saskatchewan to meet her. The difficulty with records of text messages is that whilst the police could ascertain what time a message was sent and from where it came from and who it went to, they needed people to come forward to show them the actual messages. The content of the messages themselves could not be determined from the cell phone towers. The 12th of April 2016. At 6.41am a text message was sent. Can you take me to the bank? It was from Michaela to her friend Oksana. Oksana told her that the bank didn't open up until later in the morning. There was no point going now. The morning continued as normal and after being dropped off at Sacred Heart High School, 
the school Wi-Fi showed that she had logged in at 8.08am. At 8.21, she went to her locker to drop off a binder, and she was recorded on the school surveillance cameras doing this. Just five minutes later, she left the premises via the back entrance. It isn't known which route she took when she left school, but she was seen on CCTV footage at a Super C convenience store as she walked down the railroad tracks. When she failed to arrive for her next lesson, her ex sent her a text message to ask her why she hadn't shown up. As she typed up her response, she was already on the other side of the town. She went to the TD bank, arriving before it opened. At 8.51am, she was seen talking on the phone as she waited for the bank to open up. At 8.55, the call was ended and she approached a worker when the shutters went up. She made a withdrawal of $50. The sources do differ on this, with some saying she withdrew $55, and then set off towards Terry's Pawn and Bargain, where she arrived at 9am. The owner of the pawn shop later said that Michaela was attempting to get a ring assessed. He described her as quiet and that she didn't appear to be upset or distressed. He told her the value of the ring was low, so he wasn't going to make an offer on it. She left the shop and footage from a home hardware store showed her walking towards Tim Hortons at 160 Broadway Street East at 9.11am. She was caught on the security cameras inside Tim Hortons buying a drink and sitting down to use her phone. She sat there for the next 13 minutes with her backpack next to her. One of her friends said she didn't normally use a backpack. She usually took a purse to school. At 9.23am, Michaela left Tim Hortons via one exit before returning to leave through another exit. She walked past the home hardware store at 9.42am before disappearing from view of the camera. She was then seen coming round the back of the giant tiger store and going back in the direction of Tim Hortons. When she re-entered the Tim Hortons at 9.49, she appeared to be talking on her phone. There was no record of this call. She sat in a different place, this time near the window facing the door. After finishing the call, she sat on her phone for 10 minutes, occasionally looking out of the window. At 10.03, she put her headphones in, and nine minutes later, she sent the text message to Shelby. Hey, I need help. Then 20 minutes later, the second message came through. Never mind, I figured it out. As she talked on the phone, she picked up her bag and left Tim Hortons before coming back in two minutes later, sitting back in the same spot. At 10.39, while still on the phone, she looked around and then ended the call four minutes later. She then got up and walked over to a woman sitting at a nearby table. She asked her for help in booking a hotel room. She didn't say where. The woman told her she couldn't help and Michaela returned to her seat. She then made another call and quickly left. From roughly 10.45 to roughly 11.55, her whereabouts are not known. We do know that at 11.35 she sent a message to Shelby saying, I'll see you at lunch. By 11.59, Michaela was back at school, where she told two fellow students she was getting a bus to Regina for a holiday. One of these friends later explained to the police that Michaela might have had two phones in her possession. Just three minutes later, Michaela left school again via the back door. Michaela then walked to the Trail Stop restaurant, which was about a mile away, and connected to the bus depot. The RCMP said that someone who worked at the depot had seen her there at some point between 10am and 12pm. She had asked what time the bus would be departing. She was told about 5pm, but she didn't buy a ticket. A waitress said she appeared to be normal and sat by herself to order some food. Although there were no cameras in the depot or the restaurant, witnesses were able to confirm Michaela was at the restaurant until roughly 1.45. The police do not believe that she got on a bus in Yorkton. At 3.40, Michaela's grandmother was parked outside the school, ready to pick her up, but as the minutes ticked by, Michaela didn't come out. At 4pm, it became clear that she had missed her violin rehearsal, and less than four hours later, she was reported missing by Paula. When Paula looked at the footage of her daughter, she said, this is absolutely unusual behaviour for her. She wasn't a class skipper. It seemed like she was waiting for someone. By 7am the following day, her phone had been switched off. None of the calls she had made were registered on her account, and it is not known who she was talking to. She mainly communicated via apps like Snapchat and Instagram, and potentially an app called Kick, which allows for anonymous communication. The calls couldn't be tracked due to privacy laws relating to the apps. Some of her friends said she had also made friends from the internet before. Some were not from her hometown, and at least one was from the United States of America. I never liked the idea of her messaging guys online because it's kind of sketchy, but she wouldn't listen to me. She did her own thing. 
but I probably would have done the same too, Shelby said. It would take months for the investigators to get permission from the US authorities to piece together what she was doing on social media on the day of her disappearance. It did stand out to officers that Michaela was missing. Yorkton isn't a big place, and it was usually familiar names that went missing or ran away. Officers contacted the phone companies and the banks associated with Michaela, which gave them a list of names to work with. Everybody in the community was thinking of Michaela and her family. As Bob Maloney, the mayor of Yorkton, said, when a young person disappears like this, it causes everyone great concern. Two days after she was last seen, the RCMP issued a plea to the public for their help in tracing Michaela. An alert was put out with a description of her. Caucasian, 5 foot 2, 125 pounds. Blonde hair, blue eyes, wears glasses. Wearing a teal infinity scarf, a three-quarter length burgundy or purple coat, and jeans. When speaking to her friends, the police learned that not long before she went missing, Michaela had told Oksana that she had roughly $5,000 in her account. Checks later showed she didn't have that much money at all. An Instagram post from the 1st of March 2016, showing her Snapchat profile, had the caption, Looking for Snapchat friends because I have none in real life. Add me. Please don't be a greasy f*** and send me gross-ass nudes. Just looking for a friend. Her friends gave police several names one of which was someone called Christopher from North Carolina, whom she had allegedly messaged on Instagram. This was the same name that Amy had given when telling police that Michaela had said a Christopher was travelling to Saskatchewan. The CBC contacted a man saying he was the Christopher in question, but he refused to answer any questions. He gave a brief statement. All I can provide for you is that she suffered with self-harm a few years back. Back then I was helping those who struggled and I encouraged her to fight against self-harm and to look towards God. The RCMP interviewed Christopher and so did police in the United States, and a search of his house was also conducted. Sergeant Donna Zavislak from the Historical Case Unit said the RCMP said there wasn't any evidence to suggest he was in Canada at the time of Michaela's disappearance, nor was there any evidence to suggest that Michaela may have wanted to harm herself. Shortly before she went missing, she had referenced someone called Josh, and although police didn't have a surname, they interviewed various Joshes during the investigation but these interviews turned up nothing. Several of Michaela's friends had differing accounts of things she had said about her biological father. One said Michaela had said she had wanted to meet him but didn't know him. Another said she thought he had passed away. A man called Rick later came forward and said he believed he was Michaela's dad, but Paula said there was no evidence for this. It wasn't until five days after she went missing that police contacted Rick to tell him what had happened. He began to carry out his own searches and said he hoped she was safe adding that he wanted to tell her he was sorry for all the lost time. A search of his house was conducted and DNA samples were taken. His mother's house was also searched and the RCMP said there was no evidence to suggest he was involved in her going missing. On the Valentine's Day before her disappearance, a bouquet of roses were delivered to her during a drama class. They came in a plain cardboard box, having potentially been ordered online, and she never said who they came from. The police were later able to identify the sender and said they had nothing to do with her disappearance. This was a complex puzzle to piece together and it only continued to get more complicated. Two of her classmates would tell investigators that they recalled Michaela saying she had oxycodone, a powerful opioid. One of them said she had shown them pills while at school and the police did look into these claims and concluded they were not oxycodone pills but instead Accutane, a treatment for acne. Three weeks after she was last seen, the RCMP in Yorkton gave Michaela's case to the General Investigation Section, also known as the GIS, a unit investigating major crimes and cases. As Michaela had spoken to a woman about potentially booking a hotel room, they did check hotels in the area, but she hadn't been seen on any CCTV footage or been remembered checking into a room. Extensive searches were done from the air and on the ground and included the use of drones, but there was still no sign of her. As the months passed by with no word from Michaela, life for her family had stopped. They would take it in shifts to sleep in the living room, to make sure there was someone there and awake to answer the phone in case it rang. There was, soon, a glimmer of hope. On the day she went missing, Shelby sent Michaela a message via Snapchat. It was opened three months later. Shelby would later send another message via Snapchat on their graduation day, but this one was not opened. Michaela, your snuggles and stories are missed by your brother and sister. It is with such sadness they ask. Mommy, could you take that day away and just bring Michaela home? 
Your loveliness is missed every moment. You're a beautiful, unique, and delicate flower whom I'm afraid is being trampled in a world of the uncaring, who don't know the value and the treasure that you truly are. And I am scared for you. A feeling of not knowing if you are all right is beyond heartbreaking. It is unspeakable pain and worry. I made a vow to protect and love you. I feel that I have failed you my most important role of life as a mother because I can't protect you right now. Please be safe, my love. You will always be my treasure. Lost you are now, but when we find you, we will all rejoice together. The RCMP said they had no reason to believe that Michaela had come to harm and they could not confirm reported sightings of her in Saskatoon or Regina. Jennifer Ebert, an RCMP inspector, said that more than 100 interviews had been carried out and 38 tips had come in, adding that all leads were being thoroughly looked into. She stated that the RCMP had no reason to believe she had left the country, but Border Force had been notified. Her social media profiles and bank records yielded no clues either, and provided no digital footprint for her. Inspector Ebert said the fact she was able to be missing with no footprint in this digital age, that is very disturbing to us as investigators. She added that they were trying to find a man who had allegedly been seen leaving the bus depot at the same time as Michaela. He was described as stocky to medium build, 40 to 50 years old, between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot 2, with a flaming cross on his left arm. Inspector Ebert said he wasn't a suspect and they wanted to contact him to see if he knew or saw anything. The RCMP would later receive word that the man in question had only held the door open for her and he was not connected to her disappearance. The Missing Children Society of Canada would send out an update on the 20th of July, stating that a child search alert for Michaela had been activated in Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Alberta. The CEO of the Missing Children Society of Canada, Tricia Bailey, said that the child search alert was relatively new, only having been around for four years. It works as a placeholder between a missing or endangered child and an amber alert, whilst also giving police the opportunity to use special technology as part of the search. During the six-month update on her case, her family issued a reward of $25,000 for her return, with the money being raised through various fundraising efforts, and Crime Stoppers was also offering $2,000 too. We are pleased to announce that we have reached our goal and are offering a $25,000 reward for the safe return of Michaela Bali. People have been incredibly supportive of the reward fund. Whether it was kids attending vacation Bible school who donated their coins, lemonade stands run by teenagers, bottle drives, hot dog fundraisers, GoFundMe pages, cash donations, silent auctions, steak suppers in Yorkton and Regina, and my supportive co-workers from the Ministry of Social Services, as well as local service clubs and churches. Every donation, whether small or large, has made an important contribution to this announcement. But we love her, and we are desperate to ensure that she is safe. And that is the most important at this point, is just to determine that she's safe. Paula said she was hopeful that this would make a difference to the tips coming in and added that the support of the community and knowing that they were behind her gave her hope that they would soon have the answers they were looking for. A candlelight vigil was held in Yorkton and Paula explained the community needs a place to sort of, I think, breathe and express our sorrow. Michaela's not the only missing child. Our hope always is when we plan one that maybe Michaela will be found, but we'll continue with a vigil for other parents of missing children as well and continue searching for answers. On the 27th of October, Paula travelled to British Columbia after a tip had come through saying that Michaela had potentially been spotted in the Burnaby area, but sadly, this, like all other leads, would be a dead end. How do you... I think the, the difficulty is how do you move... You just don't move forward with your life. And I can really say since April the 12th, my life is frozen and my children's lives are frozen. And you don't just move on. And life, for everybody else in the world, continues, right? But our life doesn't. It stays stuck at April the 12th. And, um, yeah, to think that um, you don't know where your child is or what has happened to them, it's unbearably painful. After the six-month update on the hunt for Michaela, Paula would later revisit Vancouver. Two tips had come in. They sounded viable. 
two unconfirmed reports of her being sighted in Vancouver after someone thought they recognised her after seeing the family's posts on social media. Paula put up several missing persons posters and tried to talk to people in the area, hopeful that something solid would come from it. According to Paula, her daughter had never expressed any interest in going to Vancouver. I didn't want to miss the opportunity if there was more information to get about Michaela's disappearance, she said. We still haven't confirmed at all that she's there. I guess we're just so desperate for information that if we hear any kind of tip, of course the RCMP follow up on it, but we try to do as much as we can as well. But just like all of the other tips, nothing would come from this. Paula and her family went to various places frequented by homeless people and also to Vancouver's downtown east side, an area reportedly battling problems with substance abuse. She said she was hopeful that Michaela wasn't there because she had no history of problems with her mental health or drug problems. However promising these tips may first have appeared, they, just like all of the others, went nowhere. After going to Vancouver, Paula said she wanted to go to Calgary and Edmonton to continue her search efforts. It has been coined it takes a village to raise a child, but I may add it could take a country to find one, Paula said. She also emphasised the impact that this was having on Michaela's family. It's been extremely taxing on my other children. It's impossible to understand the chaos and the fear it creates in the family when someone is missing. We're a really close-knit family and for her brother and sister, it's devastating. She added that she was going to be taking a leave of absence from employment to devote all of her time to finding her daughter. When Paula went back to British Columbia for the search, she told CTV News that she believed in her heart that her daughter was not safe, but was still alive. After having tips come into the RCMP that sightings had been reported at the Metro Town Mall, Paula went there to hand out flyers and talk to people. We really have no reason why she may be here, and she hasn't expressed an interest to be here, but we're willing to follow up on any bit of information we receive, she said. As December came, the festive period for many was in full swing but not for the Barley family. Paula said she was not going to be celebrating Christmas. Right now, we don't celebrate birthdays, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. I've done nothing for Christmas because it's just too painful. I don't feel like there's anything to celebrate right now until I found out what's happened to my daughter. April 12th, 2017. Michaela Barley had now been missing for a year. It had been a year of agony and uncertainty. The investigation was moved to the RCMP Historical Crimes Unit. Honey, never give up. I will never stop searching. As I've said before, my treasure's lost. I will devote myself to finding you. There is no more sense of sane or normality or continuity in a fractured family. One can't sit at a dining room table with an empty spot. One can't sleep in a comfy bed not knowing where your child is. We have not been able to move a positive identification or a confirmation of of where Michaela was past that 145 timeline at the Yorkton bus station. Um, That is information that we can't move past. People just don't vanish without anybody knowing anything. There is someone out there who knows something. It's been a year, excruciating year for this family, and they just want to know she's safe. I feel like I don't know any more today than I did at that point. And so, yeah, it is frustrating. The moment that I realized she was missing, I realized this is not going to be easy because this isn't in this child's character. So I know there's probably other issues at play that I'm not aware of. It's people's responsibility and duty to look for my daughter. No one will ever take that responsibility or duty more than their mother. And so um, I have, yeah, treaded where probably people shouldn't go, but I have um, the feeling, and just knowing my child, that, you know, she needs help. I don't believe she's safe. My sister, Michaela, vanished a year ago. It has been the saddest year of my life. My life has changed so much. I miss Michaela and cry for her every night. I don't understand what happened to Michaela. I just want her to come home. Michaela, I love you and miss you each day. If you know where Michaela is, call 911. If you have Michaela, take her to a safe place and let her go. 
then Michaela can come home to us. In July of that year, the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children said that it was possible Michaela had left Canada and had gone to the United States, possibly Portland or Seattle. But there were still no confirmed sightings. On the 15th of August 2017, a dive team began a search of Hopkins Lake behind Sacred Heart High School. The RCMP said it was not in relation to a particular tip, but rather a need to cover all possibilities. Accidental death, for example. They found nothing. In March 2018, Michaela's family announced a fundraiser called Glimmer of Hope to try and push the reward up to $50,000. Also that year, Paula spoke at a child find meeting in Saskatoon, saying that Canada should follow the example of the United States when dealing with children who go missing. It's more like a task force, she said. There are members of the military, there are members of search and rescue, there are police, there are people who can help the family. There's legal representation. They all come around and they take a bit of a different approach and it's a bit more of a concentrated search. We really need to, I think, restructure and reorganise how we look for missing children, she said. Thousands of posters were put up across Canada and in the United States to keep her name and face at the front of people's minds. We haven't lost hope, and really, in my heart, I feel that Michaela is alive, and she needs to be rescued from whatever situation she may be in, Paula said. On Michaela's 18th birthday, her mother reiterated that they were going to keep looking for her until she was found. On the 1st of July, one day before Michaela's birthday, the family held an awareness and fundraising barbecue. Paula didn't sleep that night, something she said that often happens on important days, her other missed birthday and her graduation. It's another milestone and part of you still keeps hope that perhaps today might be the day that we hear something from Michaela, if she's able to contact us. You try not to sit and stare at the phone all day, she said. According to Paula, roughly 240 tips have been received in the 14 months since Michaela went missing, adding, To me, it's not acceptable that 14 months later I still don't know where my daughter is and we still don't have any more information than the day she went missing. Time goes forward whether you want it to or not. I see Michaela's friends on social media and they're having babies and doing their careers and it's hard. I'm happy for them, but it's sad to know Michaela isn't getting to experience that with them. The 8th of August, 2019. Paula received a call. The person on the other end of the line was a man who said he believed he had talked to Michaela in March outside of the High Run Club in Edmonton. He hadn't known Michaela was a missing person until he saw posts on social media about her. When he remembered the conversation outside the High Run Club, he called the tip line and spoke to Paula. He said he had been smoking outside and he had started chatting to a woman and it was his recollection that she introduced herself as Michaela. Paula recalled, she was just outside, he had spoken to her for a few minutes. I think part of what stuck out to him was that she didn't seem like a girl that should be in that area. He said she seemed very sweet and naive. She added that when he described her personality, that was what stood out to her more. Paula passed every single tip, including this one that came through to the RCMP in spite of a somewhat strained relationship. Paula said her criticisms of the police were rooted in the fact nothing significant had been found to move the case forward, adding that she believed the RCMP was too bureaucratic and results took too long. The RCMP said that they do follow up on all tips and sightings, but sadly, despite the initial promise of this one, it failed to yield any further information. The reward for information had increased to $50,000, but sadly, in 2020, it was reported that this had been cut in half after a donor had asked for their money back. Paula said in a Facebook post, I am so grateful for the generosity and willingness of this individual to try and help us find a resolution, but I am saddened by the outcome. Not that the money had to be given back necessarily, but that Michaela Barley remains missing, and despite the increase in funds to her reward, no new information led to her whereabouts. As there is no government funding for missing families to search for their loved ones, we continue to do what we are able because of the generosity of our community. Also that year, it was reported that there had been another potential sighting of her in Penticton. Paula immediately reached out to the police, but they were able to confirm the woman in question was not Michaela. In honour of her 20th birthday, Michaela's family held a gathering to bring more attention to missing children in Saskatchewan. Paula said that one of the biggest fears for parents of missing children was that their children would become another statistic. 
that who they were would be forgotten. Roughly 25 people were in attendance and Paula emphasised that they wanted the government to do more to help families impacted by a child's disappearance. On the fifth anniversary of Michaela's disappearance, a vigil was held near her high school. It started with prayers and a moment of silence, and as the vigil went on, people went up to the podium to share in the moment with those in attendance. Time continued to tick by, and there was still no sign of Michaela Barley. On the sixth anniversary of her disappearance, a press conference was held to try and generate any new leads at all. There was also an update to the reward being offered. Anonymous business donations meant that the total had increased to $100,000. The mayor of Yorkton, Mitch Hipsley, said that these donations were a reflection of just how impacted the community was by her disappearance and how much her hometown wanted to bring her home. We're all in this together. We're all one big family. We really are. We're a small community and that's what we do, he said. There had now been over 600 tips and reported sightings of Michaela Barley but none of them had led anywhere. Police have received more than 600 tips from all over the world. The RCMP Historical Case Unit says it investigates all of them. When her cell phone stops working and the last time she's seen by her friends is basically the last contact we have of her with anyone. Um, I don't want to say that Michaela fell off the face of this earth, um, but for someone, you know, just to disappear without reaching out and contacting family and friends, especially in this day and age with technology, For investigators, that's not a good sign. We're wondering if whether or not Michaela had approached anyone else for assistance, not just just for a hotel room, but possibly for a ride somewhere, maybe some money, um, maybe the use of a cell phone, anything like that. Getting access to Bali's social media accounts has been challenging for the RCMP. Both Instagram and Snapchat are based in the United States, so they're protected by that country's privacy laws. Getting access to that took 10 months for the RCMP, and when they did get that information, there were thousands of pages of it. Sifting through that is a challenge in itself, and we have assistance units that are helping us that are doing that. Police say there's no evidence to develop any theories about what happened to Bali. In the meantime, officers, including Kim Stewart, keep turning the case over in their minds. I'm always watching, and I know that's how the other members are. You know, you don't, you don't put the investigative time in like, you know, we all have on this file and not be watching for her. In 2022, the Saskatchewan RCMP and the Washington State Patrol unveiled new trucks that travelled up and down from Mexico to Vancouver, featuring Michaela as part of the Homeward Bound program. The Homeward Bound program is a collaboration started in 2005 by the late trooper Rene Paget between Washington State Patrol's Missing and Unidentified Persons Unit and Kimway Transportation, It uses semi-trailers that travel all across North America to feature age-progressed images of the missing. Since its inception, the program has featured 32 missing children and young people, three of whom have since been recovered. By 2023, the RCMP had received more than 1,000 tips in Michaela's case, but none of these added to what they already knew. The toll that her disappearance took on her family was enormous. Every spare moment goes into finding Michaela, utilising social media, travelling around, following tips, phoning people, writing letters, and running a Facebook page called Let's Bring Michaela Barley Home. Her aunt said that her little brother and sister had stopped playing musical instruments because they couldn't play them until she came home. Michaela's little brother would struggle to pour himself a drink due to the immense guilt of not knowing if Michaela can access food and water a feeling that no child should have to experience. In talking to her two younger children about Michaela's disappearance, Paula said, I think one of the most heart-wrenching things is they sit on my knee and they go, Mom, I'm scared Michaela is going to forget about us. And I'll say she'll never forget about you and will never forget about her. The strength and perseverance shown by Paula and Michaela's family in the face of such turmoil and tragedy is nothing short of incredible. Paula's determination to find her child and refusal to give up shows a strength of character that will inspire many. She said that if she could say anything to Michaela, it would be, hang on, we're coming, we're looking, run for home when you can. If you have any information relating to the disappearance or whereabouts of Michaela Barley, please contact the Yorkton RCMP at 306 786 2400. Crime Stoppers at 1800 222 8477 or your local police service. It is hoped that someone out there knows something and that bit of information, no matter how small, 
could be the key to bringing Michaela Barley home. For those of you that like to listen on the go, we now have our episodes in podcast form and you can now find this via the link in our description box or by searching Truly Criminal Podcast on your podcasting platforms.